book of Hebrews, as we have been meditating through the book of Hebrews, this time we'll read from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, to chapter 10, verse 18. So Hebrews 9, 23, to chapter 10, verse 18. Thus says the word of God. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be, made, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is a it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For them would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins year every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he established the second. By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering, and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of sin, where remission this is, there is no more offering for sin. This far the reading of God's word. Let's come now before the Lord in prayer before men in this world and before the, thy throne in the world to come. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. 
Amen. On July 20, 1969, the American astronaut Neil Armstrong put his left foot on the surface of the moon for the first time, and he gave this famous declaration. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And indeed, that would be remembered throughout history, for a frontier was broken on that day, a day to be remembered. Well, what happened when Christ was killed on the cross could have been just another normal day, just another sacrifice in the Roman world of that time. Just another step. But it was one giant leap for mankind. But unlike Armstrong's moonwalk, Christ's sacrifice is a timeless event with eternal implications. A true milestone in the history of mankind, in the history of the universe. In fact, his perfect sacrifice would inaugurate a whole new era and it marks the central moment in the history of redemption. The perfect sacrifice has finally happened. Both the Old and New Testament comes together in this culminating moment. The perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The culmination of the Old and the beginning of the New. And today we will see how Christ conquered his sacrifice. What no one else could and gave us what we didn't deserve. And to meditate on this, we'll divide our facts into three points. First, the oneness, the oneness of the sacrifice, verses 23 to 28 of chapter 9. Second, the adequacy of the sacrifice, chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. And third, the result of the sacrifice, chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. So first, let's consider the oneness of the sacrifice. After all that we have seen regarding the earthly tabernacle, our text begins by saying that it was necessary for a priest to go where no man has gone before, to leave the earthly tabernacle behind and take one giant leap for mankind entering into the heavenly temple. That's exactly where our text picks up today. In verses 23 and 24, as Jesus entered into heaven itself, into the presence of the throne room of God. The opening verses gives us a basic parallelism. The sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, operated this way. And, it, and as we come into the dwelling of God, into God's dwelling place, we need a better cleansing to take place. In order to enter into this heavenly sanctuary, we need a better cleansing than the one that we had before. You see, blood is necessary for both of them. Blood is still necessary, but only the blood of Christ is sufficient to bring us before where God actually is. You might think that we have heard this already, and there is no need for the author to repeat this once again. Well, but the fact that he is repeating means that we are prone to forget, or that at least we are prone to doubt this truth. So he has to repeat to make us sure, to make sure that we, we are going to get this right. In the Old Testament, they entered into the place made with human hands, as we saw last time. It was all about the earthly tabernacle, about the place made with human hands. But Christ enters the real place, in order for salvation to really be possible, blood had to be sprinkled in the real holiest place. Not in the earthly tabernacle, but in the real holiest place. Not in the earthly sanctuary, but in the real sanctuary. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with, with a better blood, with the blood of the perfect lamb. So he entered the real holiest place and offered a final sacrifice where no man has gone before. He entered to present the perfect sacrifice. We have already established that Christ entered the holiest place. 
But now the author makes it specific that the throne room of God is not here, but in heaven. God's celestial mercy seat. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with, with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The language in these two verses is symbolic. There is no, no real tabernacle in heaven. You see, when we, all, we walk into heaven, we will not see the most holy place. We will not see the Ark of the Covenant. We will not see all those symbols. It's a typologic language. No tabernacle in heaven. But indeed, God's true throne room. The tabernacle was typologically pointing to God's presence in heaven. And that one must be completely clean in order to approach him. No uncleansed thing can dare to appear before the throne room of God. So now that we have access through Jesus to the better temple not made with hands, to turn to the old earthly temple would be pointless. It would even be idolatry. And why did, did Christ have to do all this? Why did he have to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice? Why did Christ enter into the presence of God? He did it for us. For us. These two little words at the end of the verse make the whole difference, doesn't it? That he did it for us. These are two little words in, in, Hebrew, in Greek as well. He did on our behalf. For us. He didn't simply do this because he had to do. Because he didn't. But he did it for me and for you. He did it for us. You see, these two little words are the difference of knowing theology and applying theology to our lives. He did it for me and he did it for you. He is there as our representative before God. I don't want you to simply leave this place saying, yes, I have learned how Christ is the perfect priest who has entered the perfect sanctuary, who has offered a perfect sacrifice before God. Oh, that is true. But even the devils know this. Even the devils know that this is a fact and a reality. I want you to know that he did it for us. That's the difference of knowing history and applying this theology to your heart, to your, your life. These two words at the end of the verse change everything. I love the opening question of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and death? Answer, that I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Just the, the opening of this answer is already amazing. You see, the comfort is not simply to know that Jesus has sat upon the throne. It's not simply to know that he has gone where no man has gone before him and presented a perfect sacrifice. The comfort is to know that he did it for us. It's to appropriate of this reality to rest completely in life and death that he did it for me. It's not enough simply to know the history if you cannot say that he did it for you. I belong to him. And his victory is now my victory. The fact that he sits upon the throne means that one day I will be with him forevermore. Because Christ entered where no one ever could. He completed a work that no one ever accomplished before. Verses 25 and 26 Christ doesn't need to repeatedly offer a sacrifice yearly as the Old Testament high priest. 
because he offered himself a better sacrifice and finally got the job done. What was the job? End of verse 26. To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We have in this verse the purpose of incarnation, that is, of his appearance. It was to put away sin. And Christ's coming is so climatic that it inaugurates a new period of time. He comes in the end of the world, or more literally, at the end of the ages. By Christ's coming, God's promises are fulfilled. And we entered into the period of time known as the latter days or the last days. By His coming, He starts the end of the ages. It's so climatic that both fulfills the old and it starts the last days. It changes history. Because His sacrifice is perfect. That means that He only had to offer it once. Verse 28, so Christ was offered once, offered to bear sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hopefully you have noticed by now that the author of Hebrews really liked this expression, once, once. He really repeats this expression over and over he really emphasizes the specialness of things that happen only once. Just in this chapter, he has used this word four times. Particularly here at the end of the, of the chapter. He uses this in verse 7, then verses 26, 27, and 28. As if he was saying, hey, you should really pay attention to things that only happen once. That is a reason. You are impressed by the high priest in the Old Testament? Well, you guess what? Jesus did something that they could never do. He did it only once, and he got the job done. Now, do you know what else happens only once? What else is unique? Your death. You only die once. Verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. You're impressed by things that happen once? Guess what? You will only die once. And after death, the judgment. Notice the imminence of the fact. All men will die without exception. Through all the all history of humanity... Only two guys got out of here alive, Enoch and Elijah. So everybody else died or will die at some point. So if you fast forward the state of this church 100 years from now, if Christ doesn't return before, guess what? We'll, none of us will be here. Perhaps with the exception of a few little babies that are about to be born, but no one else will be here. We will die. That's the reality. But we will not die and then be wandering in the void. No. After this, that is death, the judgment. Do you think God's throne is terrifying? Well, guess what? All of us had an unavoidable appointment before that throne. All of us, with no exception, will appear before that throne to give an account to God. An inescapable appointment before that throne. Do you remember the great multitude of Revelation chapter 7? That's you and me. That's all of us before that throne to give an answer to the king. Everybody will stand before that throne, before that king who has sat upon the throne and will give an answer to him before the throne of the Lamb. Every creature 
will bow. By the way, what we had only in shadows in the holiest place, on that day, we will have the real thing. In the tabernacle, we had pictures of cherubims, right? We had an empty throne. Well, guess what? When we come to Revelation chapter 7, we have the real throne with the king sitting there, and we have real cherubims flying over the throne. The hosts of heaven before that throne, singing praises to the king. You're impressed with the tabernacle? Well, guess what? You will appear before the real throne and give an account to him. But the good news for us is that the judge who sits on the throne, the one who sits as the king of the universe to judge, is also our defense attorney is also the one who presents the sacrifice in our behalf. So there is no way he will reject his people. Because the same king who holds our sentence is the one who paid the price for our sentence. There is no way he will cast us out. Because the same one who paid the price now give us the sentence. Holds our destiny in his hands. What could be our hope for this unavoidable coming judgment? Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him. Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? Christ didn't die as appointed to all men, but he offered himself to bear the sins of many. In order for the high priest to remove the sins of his people, he would have to suffer the death of his people. And who are these his people? That's the big question, isn't it? Who are his people? Well, those who look for him. He died for those who look for him. It's an interesting expression. It means to be waiting eagerly. To be waiting eagerly for something. It's quite a unique word. It appears only eight times in the New Testament. Six or Paul is using. Another one here in Hebrews. It means to be eagerly waiting for something. What are we waiting eagerly? Can we honestly say that we are eagerly waiting for Christ's second coming? This is a mark of those for whom Christ has offered a sacrifice for their sins. If you have kids around, it's easy for you to know what it means to be eagerly waiting for something. Just promise something for them. Promise that you will do something for them. Maybe that you take them out for dinner. Or that you give them a new toy. Or if your kids are like mine, that you give them a cookie. They will be eagerly waiting for that. They will be filled with expectation. They can't wait for that. Maybe they will, they will even ask you, are we there, are, are we there yet? Is it now? Can I have it now? They will be eagerly waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. Well, here is something that all of us should really be eagerly waiting for. The day that Christ shall appear a second time. We should have the same excitement, the same expectation for that day. The kids have. For the day that Christ will make, a, make us without sin. No more the struggle with sin. No more the bondage of this life. And finally to be with him. What a joy. Can we say that we are eagerly waiting for that day? 
with the same excitement, trusting that that promise will be fulfilled soon. Some wait eagerly for retirement, others for vacation. Some of the things are good. I remember before getting married that I waited eagerly for marriage. That is good. But we should never lose the focus of eternity. As the Puritans would say, we should have one eye on earth and one eye on eternity. One eye in heaven. They were concerned with the, with the things that would last forever. Like Jonathan Edwards, who prayed to the Lord, Lord, is stamp eternity on my eyeballs. That's how we should live, with eternity constantly before our eyes, longing for that day. The Hebrew converts were living a tough life. They were certainly eagerly waiting for that day. But we, we are just too comfortable. We don't long for heaven. We're just too comfortable where we are. That we forget to long for heaven. One thing that might prevent us from longing for, for heaven, for Christ's second coming, is sin. We certainly will not want to stand before the throne if we know that we are living in sin. We will not want to stand before the judgment seat knowing that we are living in sin. Perhaps if you are today living in sin, you might not want at all that he comes again, that he returns. You'll want to stand as far from him as possible. But he will come. Whether you like it or not, whether you are prepared or not, he will come a second time. Do you want a good x-ray of your spiritual life? How often do you long for heaven? How often do you eagerly wait for heaven? Not whether or not you believe in heaven. Again, even the devil does that. But whether or not you eagerly wait for that day. C.S. Lewis wrote, Too often I am afraid. Heaven is desired chiefly as an escape from hell. Can we say that we long for heaven to be with Christ? Or do we simply long to escape from hell? That's a mark from a true Christian who longs to be with his Lord and Savior. Can we say that we truly desire that, that we are filled with joy and excitement to be united with our Lord and Savior? Do we look for him? Do we wait eagerly for him? Long for heaven, dear Christian. Long for heaven. And what, what better way than the Lord's Supper to do that? In which we prepare to eat and drink in the new kingdom of heaven. As Jesus has told us to do. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as you partake next week of the Lord's Supper that will be prepared, use that time to remember. Use that time to long for heaven, to be reminded of the promise that one day, one day we will drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. We'll do it here this time but maybe next time, Lord, in the kingdom of heaven. Use that time to wait eagerly with expectation for the day that Christ himself will serve the table. Not only was Christ's sacrifice unique, but it was also adequate. It was the only fitting sacrifice, the adequacy of the sacrifice. As often the author to the Hebrews begins with an exposition from the Old Testament. This time he uses Psalm 40. 
He uses this psalm to show how external sacrifices were never enough. And a better sacrifice would have to be given, which David knew it was going to be Christ, his descendant. Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8 is quoting regarding the obedience of Christ in doing the will of God. He is the substance behind the shadow of the old covenant. The interesting thing is that the author goes to Psalm 40. He goes back to Psalm 40, almost as if he says, do you see? It was always there. Even from the Old Testament, this truth was always there. The promise was always there from the beginning. Christ was not an unexpected event in redemptive history. No, it was always there. The expectation was always there. Verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of good things should come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. These sacrifices could never make perfect those coming near to God. Then some, another sacrifice would be necessary. Although, otherwise, those sacrifices would have ended. Verse 2. The very fact that those sacrifices had to be repeated over and over again means that they were never enough. So something else had, come, had to come. The shadow could never make the comers that run to perfect. Now pay attention to what this text is saying. Or rather to what this text is not saying. It's not saying that the Old Testament was wrong and therefore pointless for us. But it's saying that it was not the whole thing. That they were waiting for some, expecting something greater who would fulfill all that was happening. We just had two very weird years during COVID. What has happened during those years? Oh, everything was online. You had classes online. You worked online. You had family gatherings online. Technology helped, that's true. But as soon as that, as all that madness was over, what happened? Well, we, we came back to in-person stuff because it's just so much better. It's no comparison. It's nothing to be compared with the real thing, with being face-to-face, -face, in person with the real thing. And maybe you cannot understand why the Jewish convert of the time of the letter of the Hebrews, wanted to go back to the shadowy form of worship in the Old Testament. But maybe you can understand why some people didn't want to get out of online activity during COVID, to get back to real person, to the real in-person world. Why? Two main reasons. First, convenience. You can be in a meeting without really being in a meeting. You might be logged in, but your mind is long, far away from that meeting. It was the same in the Old Testament. The ceremonial laws were convenient. They were all mediated by the priests. You could fall into the ritualistic repetition without really paying attention to what was happening. Second, and perhaps the main reason, it was easier to hide. During COVID, it was less personal. It was all online, through a screen. So it was easier to hide. You could hide from work. You could hide your problems from your family, from your friends. During the Old Testament ceremonies, you could think it was easier to hide. After all, it was only the high priest who had to walk into the holiest place. But what about now? Now we must take part directly and engage in what is happening here and now. Now we are exposed. We must partake and we are exposed. 
All the me's are removed. And we come in real person. By the way, we might make some of these mistakes in the Lord's Supper. Don't think your convenience is more important than attending to the Lord's Supper. Don't think you are the one in control of that table. It's the Lord's table, not yours. And especially, don't think you can hide. You can not hide your sins from the Lord, and you cannot hide your responsibility to come to that table either. So was it pointless doing all those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? No. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, that is a remembrance, again, made to sins every year. The sacrificial system was there to, to teach them something. To teach that you are a sinner and that you could never approach the holy God by yourself. That blood had to be shed in order for a sinner to be reconciled with God. The sacrifice repeated every year is a uh, reference to the Day of Atonement, as we find in Leviticus 16, reminding that the blood is required to deal with sin. But the animal blood wasn't enough. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It's not possible. It's, it's just one word in the Greek. You could say, For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It's impossible. The blood was there typologically, was never meant to take away sins, but it was pointing forward to a better blood that would be shed, who would finally take away sins. The point is not that the blood of bulls and goats wasn't good enough, but that anything else that we can think is no better than the blood of bulls and goats. Doesn't matter how much you try. Doesn't matter how much blood you offer. Doesn't matter how much good works you do. That's no better than the blood of the bulls and goats. It's impossible to take away sins apart from the blood of Jesus. And the good news for us is that the opposite is also true. With the blood of Jesus, it is impossible for sins not to be taken away. So the opposite promise is also true. That where the blood of Jesus was shed, it is impossible for sin not to be removed. Because His blood is perfect. What a wonderful truth. That where his blood was shed, sin is no more. No sin whatsoever. Since the blood of animal sacrifices can't atone for sin, therefore, Jesus has to come into the world. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, that is, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. I told you that this was a quotation from Psalm 40, a psalm of David. But here the author is saying that these words, that the words from Psalm 40 are actually the words of Jesus. We have here, what we have here is Christ is speaking in the Psalms, seeing that the voice is speaking in the Psalms is, also, is actually the voice of Christ. I'm mentioning this because I want you to, to realize how wonderful, how marvelous are the Psalms that we sing. Some people say that, oh, there is no Christ in the Psalms. Are you kidding me? Have you read Psalm 2, Psalm 22, Psalm 40? They are the very words, the very thoughts of the Messiah. They are the very words of Jesus from his lips. 
He is the one saying. The New Testament is clear to identify that for us. And he is the one speaking there. And here we have a promise of the incarnation. That he would have a body by which he would offer a sacrifice that is finally actually pleasing to God. But a body has thou prepared me. Now where else do we see this emphasis on Jesus' body? If you're thinking about what we were going to have next week, you thought, right, the Lord's Supper, Luke 22, verse 19. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's my body that is broken for you. God was never pleased with animals being broken. But he was pointing forward to that day that Christ's body was going to be broken for us. Just as in the Lord's Supper, we break the bread. Now to point backward. To say, see, his body was indeed broken on our behalf. Already in the Old Testament, there was the expectation that a body would have to be broken. Not simply of animals, but the body of the Savior. So next, next week, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, when you hear these words, this is my body which is given for you, we mem remember that he had to have a body so that it could be broken for you. Our salvation stands in the fact that he took a, the form of a, he, a real human. He endured a real sacrifice on our behalf. In fact, God has no pleasure in sacrifices simply as a religious ritual. Verse 6. Apart from a heart that is willing to please him. Notice verse 7. Then said I, that is Christ, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Again, again the words of the Psalms find its fulfillment in Jesus. So the author is mentioning that Christ's submission to the will of the Father has been written and prophesied about from the very beginning. God didn't delight in the sacrifice of animals, verse 8. But in Him that would come to do His will. And maybe you are thinking, well, what's the big deal that He did it willingly? What's the big deal of that? Well, if you think, the animals in the Old Testament were not really willing to be sacrificed. They were not there because they had a choice. They didn't choose to be there. But Christ did. I have worked with lambs for a while in the past. Do you know what is the secret for butchering a lamb? Or in fact, for most animals, you don't let them know that they will be killed. They are not there because they love you and they want to feed you. They are there because they have no choice. Those lambs in the Old Testament, when they were set aside, they had no clue they were going to be sacrificed as a sign of atonement for sin. Not a clue. But Christ was not surprised. As lambs were. He was not forced. For no one could ever force him to do that. No man taketh away from me. But I lay down myself. He went knowing and willingly. To be sacrificed for our sins. 
John 6, 38, For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. He wasn't caught by surprise. He knew. And He came down from heaven just to do the will of the Father who sent Him. He went there to die on our behalf willingly, to give His life, to take away the sins of many. That's exactly what we read in verse 9. Now for the second time we read these words, verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. O oh God. Notice the O oh God in the middle of the sentence. It, it reflects Christ's words in pouring out his heart before the Father. Then say he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O oh God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. We saw that, uh, that already, that the old covenant gives way to the new covenant. So the author now comes to the same conclusion, now from a, a different perspective. This is another area that the blood of Jesus is better than the blood of bulls and goats. Because he did it out of obedience to the Father in love for us. And that's another thing that you can meditate approaching the Lord's Supper. That the table was prepared not against his will. The blood was shed, the body was broken, not against his will. Not forcefully. But because he willingly laid down his life for us. Isn't wonderful that we can approach that table knowing that He did it out of love for us willingly to reconcile us to Himself, to give us access to Him. And He was willing to be broken on our behalf and to shed His blood for us. And because of His willing and perfect sacrifice, verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Christ showed perfect obedience to the Father, both in fulfilling the law and in His coming to the will of God to die for our sins. Not His, but ours. And we are sanctified by Christ's atoning work. This does not imply that our sanctification is complete in this life. As later the author will even urge us to live in sanctification. But that from the standpoint of God, from God's standpoint, as He looks to us, our sanctification is as if it was complete. From God's perspective, the sanctification of His elect is complete. He already sees the result. Because He sees the holiness of His Son. Christ's sacrifice is really highlighted here. And one way that he does this is that for the first time in the book, he's using the full name, Jesus Christ. You may have not noticed that, but that's the first time in the book that he mentions Jesus Christ. What a wonderful sacrifice Jesus Christ accomplished for us. Only His sacrifice was adequate, was fitting to atone for our sins because only He was the perfect sacrifice and willing to die on our behalf. But now that we consider the nature of His sacrifice, let's consider the result of His sacrifice. The result of that sacrifice. Notice the contrast between verse 11 and 12. In verse 11, we read that every priest stands daily. But in verse 12, we read that, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Do you see the difference? We have talked about this already. But you only sit down when the job is done. Notice how repetitive their work was. 
because it was never finished. Verse 11, and every priest stands daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But notice what happens when Christ comes. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. That is something else that we can meditate as we approach the Lord's table. That Christ did this once and for all. Blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. But Christ, he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Sins have been dealt with forever. Past sins, present sins, future sins, forever. Dealt with in his atoning work. And in verse 13. Is a reminder that he didn't sit down because he was tired. He didn't sit down in the couch. He sat down at the throne because he is the king. From henceforth expecting to his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 13 is a powerful reminder that if that he didn't sit down at a, at a, on any chair... He sat upon a throne, and he will place all his enemies under his footstool. The fact that he's coming again is good news for some and terrifying for others. Verse 13 is here just in case you felt tempted to, hear, to read verse 11 and 12 out of context and think that maybe Christ died for everyone. No, oh, no. You are either among those for whom he died or among those who will be broken and be placed under his feet, whom he will destroy, who will be shattered in pieces, as Psalm 2 says. That's another thing you can meditate, that you can meditate on as you come to the Lord's Supper. The table is a message that there is no neutrality. Either you are counted among those who sit at the table with him or among those who are placed under his footstool. Do you desire to have communion with God? Do you desire to have communion with Christ? Do you believe that he died for your sins? Not just for sins, but for your sins. Then make things right with him. Repent and believe and come to his table. Don't think it's a minor thing to abstain from that table. Either he was in pieces on your behalf, broken for you, or you will be made in pieces by him when he comes again. That table is a sign for those who come and a warning for those who don't. See this body that was broken? This is you apart from Jesus. This is you apart from my sacrifice. We are not Catholics. There is no grace being infused as we partake of the Lord's Supper. But it is a reminder of where we stand before the Lord. As we prepare to partake of that table, let the table be an invitation to you and a warning for those who stay away. There will be a broken body and there will be blood spilled. Either Christ's or yours. It's not the emphasis of the Lord's Supper. But it's as if a, a veiled warning behind the Lord's Supper. That salvation always comes with justice. You see how all the images, they, they are connected. God's throne room is a mercy seat. 
But at the same time, he places the enemies at his footstool. The body is broken for his people, but he breaks his enemies with a rod of iron. Again, Psalm 2. The Lord's Supper is not either or, but it's both and. It's not just frightening, as if no one could dare to come. But it's not just love, as if it didn't matter who comes and who doesn't. This is back to the Psalms again, by the way. Now he's speaking of Psalm 110. That he sat down at the right hand of the Father as King Supreme. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What a privilege we have as God's people. What a privilege God's people have to look at those pieces that are broken. And just say, it was supposed to be me. Those pieces that are being broken, that body that was broken, it was crushed by God's wrath on the cross. It was supposed to be me. When we come into communion with God, we can remember that He was broken on our behalf. We were supposed to be smashed under his feet. But now we are invited to be at the table with him. What a marvelous invitation. That our doors, our sins are scarlet. Because of his sacrifice, we are made whiter than snow. And we are invited to be at the table with him. What a privilege. That the king invites us to partake of this supper in communion with him. Why can we come to him? Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Two words that the author of Hebrews really likes is better and perfect. We have seen them over and over again by now. We have already seen how both of them refer to Christ, right? How Christ is the perfect priest, the perfect sacrifice, the better high priest, the better prophet, the better sacrifice, the better access to God. But now finally he shares how we are perfected by Christ. Who is the captain of our salvation, perfect through suffering? That's back to chapter 2, verse 10. Here is the promise given by the Holy Spirit to Jeremiah, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I written them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. What a promise. Now through Christ's coming, He will remember our sins no more. The ceremonial law could never take away the sins, but now, yes, now finally the sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Because we can say that God doesn't remember our sins anymore. We can now enjoy the freedom to come to Him. To come into His very presence. To enjoy, enjoy a restorative communion and fellowship with Him. And because of that, we don't need more offerings for sin. Verse 18, now... Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. We can come into God's house. We can come into the presence of God. And we can sit at the Lord's table. 